Welcome everyone to the first of four sustainability webinars we will hold in the spring of 2019. My name is Karin Verschuren. I am a doctoral student here at TC and will be your host today. This pilot series was initiated by the Teachers College Working Group on Environmental and Sustainability Education and the series is sponsored by the Office of Digital Learning with the goal to leverage technology to connect research experts and teachers. Um, today's an introduction to sustainability education, thinking global, educating local. We will present a historic perspective, field perspectives, and provide some research and data from New York City public schools. We have five phenomenal guest speakers here today. Professor Oren Bismani levy from Teachers College, who's sitting next to me. Uh, the day is Copeland from the New York City DOE Office of Sustainability, who's also here with me. Erin um, Laraway, Sustainability Coordinator at a high school in Brooklyn, and Ellen Kerr and Sarah McDowell from P77K, who lead the sustainability initiatives there, and we will introduce them in more detail later. We're using Zoom as our technological platform. For those of you who've not used it before, I'll take a minute to explain some of the functionality. Um, first, I've muted all the participants so you won't hear any background noise. And then very simply, you have three functions at the bottom. One is a chat function. Feel free to, to try it out and say hello now if you want to. We will be monitoring that all along. Um, and if you, if you have questions for the speakers that you would like to send during the presentation, use the Q&A option at the right. It allows all the panelists to see the questions and we will try to tackle as many as possible during the last 10 to 15 minutes. Uh, please only use the Q&A question Q&A button for questions as the panelists cannot keep track of the chat, um, chat function. Um, we have Cassidy also who's here with us and who will also keep an eye on the chat box and let us know if you have any issues. So before we begin, I'm going to launch a poll just to see who's with us today. Um, if you could just take a few seconds to fill that out. Give you 10 more. All right, so sharing the results. So, so far we have no teachers yet. Um, we have a few people working for nonprofits and then others. Um, not sure who that is, but Welcome, everybody. Welcome, Welcome yes. <laughs> so without further ado, I would like to introduce our first guest speaker. Professor Oren pismani levy is one of the founding members of the working group um, on environmental and sustainability education here at Teachers College. He's been a professor here since 2013 and is an assistant professor in the Department of International and Transcultural Studies. Oren received his PhD from Indiana University in both sociology and education. His research interests center on educational policy movements such as accountability, environmental and sustainability education, and sexuality education. He's both a passionate teacher and a research, and I'm excited he will share his work with us today. Oren, it's all yours. Okay, thank you, Karen, and welcome everybody to our first webinar uh, in this series. Uh, we are very excited to have the opportunity to do this and to uh, share with you um, the research that we've been doing here at TC uh, with, uh, in collaboration with the Department of Education. Um, on the screen, you can see my email. Uh, if you can go back to that for a second. Uh, feel free uh, to contact me after our webinar. If you have any questions, if you want to see uh, or read uh, additional resources, I'm more than happy to share with you uh, resources. So I think the best place to start is by asking what do sustainability and sustainable development means to you? So if uh, you can take a couple of seconds and type your definition in the chat box, uh, we're going to share and see how you define the core concept of sustainability. Can you see it as well? Okay. 
see. We are waiting to get one or two definitions from you all. Getting anything? Is it going to be on the chat or in the Q&A? No, it's going to be in the chat. Yeah. Don't be shy. Yes, we'll give you a couple <laughs> of more seconds. We're not judging. This won't be graded, will they, Lauren? No, not graded. Okay. okay. Should we let's move on? Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you, everybody, for those who tried to type in. Um, what we are going to do, usually I'm using this, I see uh, something on the mall. Maybe we have something. Great. So I see. Thank you, Sarah, so much. So I'm going to read your definition out loud. Sustainability means our relationship with our environment. It is more than garbage and recycling. It has to do with social justice in our environment. Thank you so much. Um, what we did, uh, and Erin is defining it as caring for and protecting ecosystems. Thank you very much, both of you. Uh, when we uh, ask people about their definition of sustainability, we're hearing uh, similar uh, ideas like Erin and Sarah shared with us but we're also hearing other things. In 2016, together with my colleagues at the Department of Education, Office of Sustainability, we conducted a survey of 1,400 uh, educators in the city and asked them the same questions, what do sustainability and sustainable development means to them? Um, together with students here at the, the college, we analyzed these responses, and I'm going to share with you a couple of examples so we can start the discussion around what sustainability and sustainable development is all about. Here are a couple of examples from our survey. First, in, uh, respondent said, sustainability is ensuring a good recycling, reusing program to impart knowledge on students and staff uh, on conserving energy. So you can see very similar to Erin and Sarah, we have an emphasis here about the environment, issues of recycling and energy conservation. Another respondent said, uh, sustainability is to always act in the best interest of protecting existing resources and extending the longevity of the planet, reusable resources. So once again, you can see an emphasis here on resources. Here are two other examples. It means civic responsibility to our planet. And to be sustainable is to have endless viability, not only as a society or a physical city, but as an integrated ecosystem working in tandem with the world around us. So you can see that uh, people have different definitions. Some of the definitions are very short. Some of them are more complicated. Uh, some of them are emphasizing resources. The others are uh, emphasizing saving of resources of the planet or the ecosystem. And you can see that in some cases, people are uh, emphasizing uh, our planet or we can do it, uh, etc. When we look at the um, 1,400 different definitions that we received, uh, here is what we got when we looked at the themes. So you can see in this chart that there are a couple of common themes across the respondents in New York City. 42%, for example, used first-person terms like I, we, our planet. This is a very good indicator that people feel ownership or uh, connectedness to the concept of sustainable development. One third of respondents, 31%, are talking about the three R's, meaning reduce, reuse, and recycling. 30% are focusing on environmental focus. 25% are talking about waste or preventing waste. 18% look at the school level. 17% talk about saving resources, etc. However, sustainability is more than these words. And when we look at the whole set of themes that people have, we come across this kind of a complicated visual. Each of these uh, circles is a theme. Uh, like the first person theme that I explained earlier, or the three R's that uh, we talked about. And you can see that the themes are connected if people are mentioning them together. Overall, in our sample of New York City educators, we see that there is a core of definition that centers on the environmental aspect of sustainability, meaning uh, the recycling, reusing, reducing waste, preventing waste, or reducing waste the environment, saving resources, a little bit of schools, 
um, and some other issues like the system uh, and the neighborhood. However, as you can see from the figure, uh, people are using other terms to define sustainability. So people are talking about the social aspect of sustainability, people are mentioning the economic side of sustainability, and all of these uh, themes are at the periphery of uh, this visual. I hope everybody can see that. So if we take this um, idea of this is how people define sustainability, and we go to the official definition of sustainability, we'll start seeing some contrasts that will be really interesting for us to explore. Here is the, um, I think one of the most common definition or the first definition of sustainability from the Brutland Report of 1987. They define sustainable development is development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. So here we are really talking, centering on needs and on issues of equality between the current generation, the next generation, and we're talking about the world as the whole with centering the issue around uh, development. So as you can see from this definition, uh, sustainable development is not only recycling, it's more than waste and waste management, and there are different aspects to it. More recently, people began to think about sustainable development as three pillars. And I'm sure some of you saw this Venn diagram before of the social, the economic, and the environmental. The three pillars of sustainability that are being uh, celebrated and used uh, to explain what we mean by sustainability. So sustainability is what you see as the core of the Venn diagram, the gray area, where it's saying sustainability. And the three aspects of social, economic, and environment are the pillars that are in some ways the foundations to get into or to get uh, to a sustainable future. So when we talk about the social, we are talking about uh, standard of living issues, human rights, civil rights. When we talk about the economic, we're talking about development, we're talking about um, issues of income to persons, we're talking about national development. And when we talk about the environment, we're talking about issues of the planet, animals, resources, etc. When each of these two circles are overlapping, another theme emerge. So for example, when you look at the overlap between social and environmental issues, that's where environmental justice come to the front. And here the idea is that we need to make sure that environmental issues are not only, um, they are not only part of the experience of minority population or people that are uh, not privileged or suffering from low SCS and other lack of resources. The link between economic and uh, social, that's where business ethics come to the forefront, where we are looking at people having equal opportunities in the job market. Um, we at the college, um, we use these three pillars as well when we teach about sustainability and when we talk about our own sustainable practices. However, we tend to reorganize it a little bit to recognize the um, limitation of growth on the planet. So we, rather than using the Venn diagram, we're looking at the environment within it nested societies and within it nested the economy. And the main idea here is that the economy cannot have the same size as the environment. After all, we have one planet when we are limited in our growth and development within that planet. Uh, this also put the economy as not necessarily uh, the end goal, but a mean to allocate resources and others, but it's not the driving force. Um, these two different visions of sustainable development are being used worldwide. Um, and people are using that not only to design programs and education activities, but also design policies. In the next part of my talk, I would like to get to the history of how we got to here. Uh, so I'm going to give you a very short history of environmental and sustainability education. As Karin told you earlier, I'm interested in global educational movement and how they become a thing. So when we look at the history of environmental and sustainability education, we can learn a little bit about the roots of why we are here, why we have uh, this webinar to begin with. So if we go back to the 60s, one of the most important publications in the 60s that uh, launched the modern environmental movement is the book by Rachel Carson, a scientist named The Silent Spring. In The Silent Spring, uh, Rachel Carson is telling us a story about community that is suffering from uh, the overuse of DDT and what happened to that community and the damage that DDT made to wildlife, birds, bees, uh, agriculture, animals, etc. 
the sad message of that story is that relying on DDT and other um, chemicals is actually creating a silent spring rather than having a spring that is more uh, colorful and more with more animals and bees buzzing around it's actually more silent and sad uh, she started a conversation that is really important not um, not only for environmental education but for the environmental movement in general another piece or artifact that helped us to get into where we are today are first images of planet earth from space so in 1968 this picture called Earth Rise was taken by the crew of the Apollo 8 mission. This is one of the first time we have a, a colored picture of planet Earth from afar. A uh, couple of years after, we got this one, the blue marble from 1972 from Apollo 17. And again, it's one of the first time that citizens of the planet could see the planet from afar as one system that is limited. It's pretty, it's precious, it's very colorful. Um, and this was really one of the early signs of the modern uh, environmental movement. Another way to look at the rise of the environmental movement is by counting some national activities, as I'm presenting to you here uh, from a chart from a very uh, known paper from 2000, uh, the nation state and the natural environment over the 20th century. Here, each line represents uh, different activities. For example, the black, uh, solid line represent chapters of environmental, international, non-governmental organizations in each country. The dotted line is national parks or others represent state membership in environmental, international governmental organization. How many countries have environmental ministries or how many countries have environmental impact assessment laws. And overall, you can see a clear pattern that over the past 20th century, more and more countries are taking more and more steps in order to protect the environment in their country. Uh, some of the growth is happening after World War II, when the United Nations system is emerging, and other, other spikes in the charts are happening in the late 60s, early 70s, very soon after the publication of The Silent Spring and the images from the space that I shared with you earlier. Um, more specifically about environmental and sustainability education, are a set of milestones that are important for us to think about. In the 1970s, we have the International Working Meeting on Environmental Education and the School Curriculum that happened in Nevada in the United States. Uh, at that meeting, representatives of 14 different countries came together to start thinking about what do we need to do in order to protect the environment and to use education to protect the environment. That meeting led to several other meetings in the 70s, in Belgrade, Tbilisi, uh, Moscow. Interestingly, these meetings took place in the eastern part uh, of the globe, uh, what used to be the former uh, USSR. Uh, this meeting continues into the 90s. 1992, we have a very famous UN conference on environment and development in Rio de Janeiro. Uh, that conference resulted in Agenda 21, a very interesting document that set out a set of policies and templates for what countries governments, NGOs, and communities can do in order to protect the planet. 1997 uh, is the International Conference on Environment and Society in Saloniki in Greece. 2002, the World Summit on Sustainable Development in Johannesburg, also known as uh, Rio de Janeiro Plus 10. And in 2005, the UN is de dedicating a full decade um, to celebrate and work on education for sustainable development. Uh, we will talk more about that in a couple of minutes. So these milestones um, are important to look at because they provide us some kind of a history to see where we are coming from and which kind of practices uh, evolved over the years. I want to highlight two, uh, two, three more milestones that happened more recently, 2007 and 2012, the International Conference on Environmental Education or the UN Conference on Sustainable Development, and more recently, the 2015 a uh, meeting in New York City where the UN members uh, adopted the Sustainable Development Goals, also known as SDGs. One of the interesting ways to teach this quick history with students is by looking at visuals that were used to present the different conferences. And here, I'm going to show you the first visual is from 1992. Look carefully at this visual and try to unpack which kind of elements 
are shown in this visual. I'll give you a couple of seconds. If you look carefully, you can see a hand or a dove, a white dove or a blue dove holding a planet. And the planet is marked with leaves for environmental. The message here is that peace and humans can take care of the planet. Moving to uh, Rio Plus 10 in Johannesburg, you can see a very similar figure, just with the title for the uh, Johannesburg 2002, which means that there is some kind of continuity with the key messages that the conferences are signaling. However, when we move to 2012, you can see that the logo is changing dramatically. I'll give you a minute to look and unpack the three different elements here. We are celebrating Rio plus 20. However, you can see that the role of the environment is now part of larger picture. We have the environment marked by the leaf. We have the bars. We have the bars marking development and we have humans or social marked by the human figure. This uh, represent a change in the discourse or our understanding of, of environmental and sustainability education, where we have um, a combination of both the economy, the environment, and social. I want to move quickly to share with you some good news. Environmental and sustainability education is going global. In this chart, I'm showing you findings from a, a paper published recently showing how social studies textbooks in 87 countries are including more and more messages about the environment. So if you look at the bars for the all, all set of books, you can see that in the 70s, only 25% of the books had any mentions of environmental in them. And then in the 90s or early 2000s, it's spiking to 52% or half of the textbooks. We're not talking about uh, science textbooks, we're, we're talking about social studies, and this is a really important message. Another evidence to the going global pattern is this one. This is a textbook of English uh, for early grade in Mongolia. Even in an English textbook, I found in my research that there is a full chapter dedicated to the environment. The case for the environment is really going global and we can see it in textbooks. I want to show you a couple of more data points to convince you that this is really going global. Here is findings from the OECD uh, PISA study of 2006. At the bar, the blue bars represent how many students are studying in schools where there is no environmental topics included in the curriculum. And you can see that it's really minimal. The US, we're talking about less than 5% of the students are studying in school where they have no exposure to environmental topics. The other chart is a little bit more complicated. I'll mark the US for you. And here we are showing you where environmental topics are sitting. So you can see that in many students are exposed to environmental topics in the natural science or science curriculum. Um, others have it in geography or in other courses. It could be social studies, history or civics. And in the US, US uh, the United States is one of the countries that um, uh, many schools have a specific course or class dedicated to environmentalism and sustainability. Um, in sake of time, um, I'm going to jump and show you a little bit um, of an important figure, also coming from the OECD PISA of 2006. And here, the main message is that if we want kids to learn about environmental topics, we have to include it in the school. This figure is showing you where kids are learning about environmental topics. You can see the core, including internet and books, family, friends, then comes radio, television, newspapers, magazine. School is where most of students are learning about air pollution and energy shortages, biodiversity, clearing forests, water shortages, and nuclear waste, etc. So these figures together just show you how much uh, environmental and stability education is going global. I'm going to stop here, but I, before I'm moving on, I just want to make sure that everybody knows that this is not only a global issue, it's actually here in New York City. My colleague, Tal Copeland from the Department of Education, will talk with you in a minute about what the Department of Education Office of Sustainability is doing in order to transmit and help uh, schools to engage with sustainable development. Thank you so much, Oren. Thank you for sharing the history and some of the data.
Um, so next is Thaddeus Copeland. He's a deputy director of sustainability for New York City Department of Education and previously managed an environmental education program that worked with K through 12 New York City students on recycling and zero waste programs. He holds a master's degree in sustainable development from SIT Graduate Institute in Brattleboro, Vermont and a postgraduate certificate in sustainability strategies from the new school in New York City. Um, Thad oversees the implementation of a number of school sustainability programs that support sustainability coordinators and strengthens the relationship between school facilities and education. Welcome, Thad. Thank you. Um, I'm excited to be here and to uh, share and talk a little bit about what's happening in New York City at uh, within my office and some context for our work um, and how we are situated within the large agency known as the Department of Education. Um, what I, what to, to start off with, first of all, I wanted to say we're uh, thrilled because this year actually marks 10 years that our office has existed. We were founded in 2009, so uh, it's been great. I've only been a part of it for about three of the years, but our office has really grown and seen tremendous um, uh, development with our programs, but also with uh, the way that schools have been integrating sustainability has really been encouraging. So we're happy for that movement and momentum. Um, about us, we're located in the Division of School Facilities, um, and basically our, our mission and objective is to engage staff and students, essentially anyone within the DOE, on best ways to integrate sustainability practices and programs into their daily operations uh, and work life at DOE. Um, most of you joining us today, I have a feeling live in New York City, but everyone may not. So this may, might be news to some of you, but we're the largest school system in the, in the nation. And what that means, I have some numbers there on the side looking at the impact and how we illustrate that. Um, the, the things that I want to point out about that that are, I think are sheer staggering are one out of every 300 Americans is a student in New York City schools. I think that's pretty neat to think of it that way. Um, and our land, our, our geographic footprint uh, is 40% of all uh, New York City owned buildings. So all municipally owned buildings in New York City, 40% of them are a DOE building. So the, I mentioned our founding 10 years ago as an office. The whole reason behind that early on and still true today is to address the sheer impact of our facilities. Uh, looking at the number of people we interact with in our buildings uh, has an enormous impact on the environment. The energy used to heat and cool our buildings, the waste generated by our buildings, the water used in our buildings, so the whole approach to sustainability at DOE from its inception and still today is to address that impact. Um, and I'll talk more in a minute how that is growing and evolving. Um, as you might imagine, we have goals, ambitious goals uh, that drive our work, uh, largely revolving around these four categories. Um, the first one and perhaps the most significant one is energy and climate. Uh, we have some ambitious goals to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions 80% by 2050. Our waste uh, goal to send zero waste to landfills by 2030. Um, I'll talk more about the energy and waste ones in a following segment on a little mini case study. Uh, we also do work with water and green infrastructure. It's extremely important in New York City. We're a city surrounded by water, so we not only want to consume conserve the water we consume, but also we want to think about our runoff and how that affects the water streams or where our schools are located. And also making sure children in New York have access to a garden or a green space is very important. And then uh, lastly, but equally important, are our partnerships in education. It's how we work with uh, others to push this into our schools, to integrate it into the classroom and across facilities, uh, but also how it's taught. And so these are all areas I'm going to speak to today. Um, most of these, especially the ones to the left of the screen, the energy, climate, waste goals, are all founded in our uh, sort of blueprint for our operations, which comes from uh, Mayor de Blasio's One New York. Uh, this is a, a published four years ago, and it has sets out all of the landmark goals for New York City. And these are where we get our operation mandates um, that are what we are targeting to hit. Um, so how do we do this? We have goals. I've mentioned them. Uh, we're going to talk about two really in depth and a little bit with uh, the waste and the energy. I'm going to give you a case study of how we're actually able to make these programs happen in our schools, but a little bit about our strategy. 
uh, layered approach. I use the word layer because I like to think of the DOE as an onion. It's a large organization. You peel back one layer and, oh, my gosh, there's another whole office you've never heard of. So um, if anyone's worked there, you know what I'm talking about is true. But it's, a, it's an important approach that we integrate this through every aspect. Um, it's not just the classroom. It's not just facilities. It's the whole. And so that's our, our first approach is a layered approach. The second approach is I'm using the word confluence, talking about the merging of facilities and education. Uh, as I mentioned early on, uh, we, our office is formally housed in the Division of School Facilities. So we're approaching sustainability from a facility lens. But we work for the Department of Education. It would be a huge miss for us not to um, address the education side of sustainability. So I think we're uniquely positioned and situated to do just that. So our office, a key strategy is to connect education opportunities to the building assets, the building infrastructure. And we do that by working with internal and external partnerships. It's extremely critical. And then lastly, I'm going to talk about the robust programs. Um, I shared just a minute ago about two of our largest goals with energy and waste. So I'm going to now talk about a case study on each of those to illustrate how we are taking this layered approach, this confluence of facilities and education to meet these goals around these programs. Um, looking at energy and uh, climate first, um, you know, looking at this goal, it's a huge goal. In DOE buildings to re reduce greenhouse gas emissions 80% by 2050 is the first goal. The second goal, reduce greenhouse gas emissions 35% by 2025. When you look at those two and you think, okay, 35% by 2025, that uh, is a little more, sounds a little less daunting than the first goal. And that goal, we are looking or approaching both these goals from a wide range of actions. But the first goal, I believe, is addressed, can be addressed more through human behavior, addressing uh, how humans interact in the buildings or habits on, in the buildings every day. The second goal is much more drastic. And to address that, uh, we really have to look at our facilities and how they operate and how we can upgrade them with uh, infrastructure to run more efficiently. And one of the ways we're doing that is through the creation of the country's largest solar program. Um, we have a goal in one NYC that I mentioned earlier to uh, create 100 megawatts of solar on city-owned buildings by 2025. And if you think about DOE buildings, if anyone's ever seen a DOE school, most of them have flat roofs. So we have a lot of real estate uh, to do this. Um, and one of the reasons we're doing it is uh, to directly address and combat uh, climate change and the efficient operation of our buildings. Um, and solar, as you might know, is economical, environmental, but most importantly for us, it's educational. And what we have done is um, worked with a number of partners across uh, the system to use solar as a tool to uh, teach about sustainability education, but it really became a catalyst for our office. We were able to look at solar internally with other offices within DOE, the STEM within the Division of Teaching and Learning and the Career and Technical Education Office, and externally with DCAS, the city agency um, that funds a lot of our work, funds the solar panels, and Solar One, a nonprofit in New York City with a lot of expertise in this area. We're able to work with these partners to say, hey, we have a great opportunity here to use this infrastructure that's on our roof that's probably not known to the people in the building that it's even up there because you can't see a lot of these solar panels. We have a great opportunity to harness this as a teaching tool. So working with these entities, uh, Solar One, STEM, CTE, and DCAS to fund it, we were able to uh, create a professional development program that's now in the second year. We've uh, trained over 800 educators for free of charge about how they can teach about solar in the classroom. The cool thing about this program too is your school doesn't have to be a solar school to attend this. Um, and it's targeted for different grade, grade groups, so it's age appropriate. The other thing about is we wanted to bring solar inside the building. So we worked with DCAS to pay for display monitors in these buildings so they could actually see how much electricity is being generated on their rooftops and being used in their school. Another evolution of this program is what I'm calling the layered approach. And I'm using that word because we're looking at other DOE offices that I mentioned, specifically uh, STEM and the Career Technical Education Program. And we have these awesome career tech schools across our city that are using solar as a, or they're, sorry, they're using their programs to teach vocational skills. So we wanted to take solar and use it as a vehicle to teach about a green workforce and green development. 
And as of this year, it's in 11 CTE high schools, and we've had over 180 students that have participated to learn about solar that they can use to take into their career. Um, the other goal I wanted to touch on as a case study is our, our waste goals, our zero waste program. This is an ambitious goal as well, to send zero waste to landfills by 2030. Um, and what we mean by that when we say zero waste is not that we want schools to, or we want schools to create less waste, that's the goal, but we, we realize that it's impossible for schools to create zero waste. So, but our goal is for the waste that is created in these schools, that it's all captured in a stream that can be either recycled or composted. And um, what this looks like formally through a program was uh, we started out four years ago with 100 schools. They're all outfitted with uniform infrastructure with all the bins and to be the same uh, in the cafeteria as well, specialized training and education resources. But we knew this just wasn't enough. Uh, you can provide bins all day long, but if no one knows how to do it or knows the importance of those practices, uh, the bins won't be used correctly. So again, looking at partnerships, looking at opportunities uh, to engage students, we took an opportunity to create the Zero Waste Schools program through partners with Department of Sanitation and Grow NYC's Recycling Champions program that created educational materials and resources to directly uh, create this change in the schools, connecting the bins to human behavior and human habit. This also was the catalyst of our office for the creation of our very first outreach team who's, focused, who's featured on this slide. So we could directly work citywide with schools, provide on the ground support uh, to help schools achieve uh, it, support not only with waste, but sustainability issues across the board. Um, and then since then, this was launched four years ago, it's created this uh, spinoff of two other new programs. Uh, one working directly with another DOE office, Service in Schools, so we're looking at how can we use this message of zero waste, waste reduction, uh, to learn about service learning. And then the second one is uh, with Department of Sanitation, the Zero Waste Pledge Schools program. So we wanted schools across the city to say, hey, I think we can do this at our school. We may not be on this exact area where the program was launched initially, but there are ways that we can take what we've learned here and apply it citywide. So th this is all part of our strategy to work with uh, others to increase our message, increase our reach. Um, but also, I think it's important to talk about how we have a network of partners behind what we do. Um, I didn't list them all because we have a growing number. There's 46 of them externally, six internal. When I say an internal partner, I'm talking about offices such as STEM, Office of School Food, uh, and others. Um, but we are working with all of these people to help us uh, cast a wide net across the city. We, meet biannually with these partners and we use these partners also to help us with our trainings that I would like to also mention are open for all staff uh, to attend because we know that sustainability is a message that should resonate with everyone. So that's that's an overview of DOE. Thank you so much Thad. Um, so next uh, we'll go to the schools. Um, so I'll introduce Erin Laraway um, first. Um, Erin teaches high school students with autism at the Roy Campanella Occupational Training Center in Brooklyn, New York. She has a Bachelor of Science in Economics from the City University of New York College of Staten Island, Master's degree in Adolescent Special Education from Pace University, and is currently pursuing a Master's degree in Educational Leadership from Hunter College. Erin is an alum of the New York City Teaching Fellows and the AmeriCorps New Teacher Project. In her role as Sustainability Coordinator, she has successfully secured grant awards for the design and construction of a wheelchair accessible edible and pollinator garden. So welcome, Erin. Um, yeah. Take it away. Thank you for that introduction. Uh, again, my name is Erin Laraway. I'm a teacher and sustainability coordinator at P721K in Brooklyn, New York. Um, I've served as a sustainability coordinator for the past five years. And in my role as a sustainability coordinator, I collaborate with administrators, custodial staff, teachers, um, and paraprofessionals towards school-wide recycling and energy saving initiatives. Um, the majority of my time as a sustainability coordinator goes to overseeing the school garden. Um, so through seeking donations, organizing cleanup events, and writing grants. So here you can see, um, so five years ago, 
I wrote a grant to fund the construction of a wheelchair accessible garden through Grow NYC. Um, all of our beds are 24 inches high uh, so that the students can access them from wheelchairs. We also have a wheelchair ramp and a paved pathway for the wheelchairs to go into the garden. Um, our students and staff work together to construct the space. And we currently have an edible garden, a native species garden, and pollinator habitat. Um, our recycling initiatives include, um, well, last year we won a, a grant actually from the Office of Sustainability. We got about 200 green and blue recycling bins for both our elementary and our high school. Um, we also work with the zero waste coordinators at the Office of Sustainability uh, to coordinate uh, logistics between DSNY and the school. So in my role as a sustainability coordinator, I have facilitated many partnerships. Um, this year, first and foremost, I have to say that we are partnering with Columbia University. Uh, which has been a great thing for our school. We have two graduate students here uh, who have designed a curriculum based on environmental literacy for students with disabilities. And uh, the <coughs> in the classroom and the hope is that the lessons will translate into the garden when the weather is beginning. And that has been a really wonderful partnership for us so far. Um, so here we have uh, the Wild Bird Fund. Our students and staff have actually rescued injured birds that we found in the garden um, and brought them to the Wild Bird Fund in the Upper West Side where they were rehabilitated and released. Um, Eco Schools has certified our pollinator garden as a native species habitat. Um, let's see. We were one of the first schools to pilot the Garden to Cafe program um, it's been ongoing for five years. Uh, the Garden to Cafe program is a school food uh, initiative to promote healthy eating. We have trained chefs that come to the school and teach our students how to prepare recipes using vegetables from the garden. Um, Project Butterfly donated all of our plants for our pollinator garden. Um, New York Restoration Project came and volunteered their time to build two more garden beds for us, um, as well as a shade arbor. And our students have used the skills that they've learned in the garden to, um, to care for their local community and participate in park cleanups. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so we've had multiple awards and recognitions for our work. Uh, in 2016, we received a citation from the Brooklyn Borough President, Eric Adams. Um, New York Restoration Project Rose Award was uh, given to us in 2015 for our work in the garden. Um, the Golden Apple Award from DSNY and of course, numerous uh, grants and donations to support our gardening initiative. Next. So uh, some things that we've learned, um, our students benefit from outdoor hands-on learning experiences. Um, Research does suggest that spending time outdoors in nature reduces anxiety and improves cognition. So um, we found that spending time in the garden actually reduces stress for our students and staff. Um, students are motivated and happy to learn outdoors. And we've also seen increased student engagement both in the garden and in the classroom after garden activities. And to conclude, um, just to point out here, you can see some uh, before and after photos. So before the garden was an unused um, overgrown space on the side of the school. And after you have your uh, raised garden beds and wheelchair pathway. Thank you. Thank you so much, Erin. Um, so last but not least, um, we'll move to PS77. Um, and we have two teachers who are with us today, um, Ellen Kerr 
and Sarah McDowell. And Ellen is one of the founders and the original members of the sustainability team. And she's been a vital part of all the initiatives at um, 77K. And she's since passed on the baton to share her valuable resources and information and knowledge with new teachers such as Sarah McDowell and Jasmine Murphy. Um, and they've had the opportunity to take on new aspects of sustainability and obtain grants. And they'll explain a little bit more now. I'm, I'm Sarah and this is I'm Ellen. Ellen. Yeah, so. so if we could go to the next slide, please. So we're talking about the history of P77K sustainability efforts. Next slide, please. The P77 garden, we're going back to 2003. In the past, the P77K school garden was a beautiful floral garden. It was a floral garden because it was assumed by the botany teachers that it might have a high concentration of lead due to the age of the building. Next slide, please. Uh, uh, back. Oh, no. Yeah, no, yes, right, right, right. Teachers and students worked in the garden and attended daily classes at the Brooklyn Botanical Garden to further their botany skills. Eventually, fruits and vegetables were planted in large containers located on the side of the school building. The containers were placed on the concrete walkway and they never were placed in the school garden. However, it was a great way to put, while well, we didn't have gardens and cafe back then, we did have an ADL room where the students cooked and many of those fruits and vegetables were used there. Next slide, please. Fast forward to 2018 and rats. Uh, just to let you know, I wrote a grant, and so we're fast forwarding. Mrs. Kimbelez, up oh, back, please. Okay, Mrs. Kimbelez, who was an integral part of Project Reds, insisted that a soil test be completed for possible contamination. I agreed, as some staff members felt that we should plant vegetables in the soil garden. The test showed that the lead content was 408 ppm which is above the acceptable limit for planting any type of, any edible plants. Next, please. Project RACS. P77K at 902, building was being renovated. We assumed that parts, oops. Assume that parts of the school grounds would not be in great shape upon our return, and we were correct. The school garden was overgrown with English ivy, garbage, and construction debris. was scattered throughout it too. We were devastated and were wondering how we could get our floral school, our floral school garden back into its splendor. Ellen Kerr, which is me, the former sustainability coordinator, wrote a $5,000 New York City DOE Office of Sustainability grant, which she was awarded. Thus be Thus, we began to clean up and beauty, beautify the school garden. I just want to stop for a minute. Though the two students you see are students, adolescent students with autism. And when we brought them back there to the garden, they assumed responsibility of that garden. They wanted to work. This was their garden. They wanted to do the soil samples. They loved it. Going back to 2003, when you saw the garden in its splendor, that was also used as a teaching tool and um, the students just loved it. It was a sensory garden too. Mm -hmm. Fast forward, I mean, move forward. Thank you. The cleanup. Students worked together to make rags a success. I was amazed at how well they all enjoyed working in the garden. And you'll see some of the debris that was left behind. It was a mess. There was English ivy all over the garden. I had to cut through it first so the students could help me um, basically throw it away. Next slide, please. Some construction items found in the garden. You will see chains. You would see a ton of debris. You would see files. I could not let the students go back there. I had to go in first to make sure all these items were out. So we take it piece by piece. That's how much was back there. Next slide, please. Students and staff working together. You'll see how the paraprofessionals and students work so hard in the cleanup. That's one of our students. Um, I don't like to use the phrase lower cognition because I don't really think he is, but one of our more challenging students working with the paraprofessional. And you'll see how we're able to get two, actually the hog feeders. 
and that's going to help us so we don't have too much uh, soil contamination because of the lead. Next slide, please. Recycling at 77K, one of my favorite topics. Students were given a tally sheet, which was broken down into three categories. Uh, what was it? Trash, recycling, and then was metal and plastics? Mm -hmm. Yes. And uh, using the following percentages, which were color-coded, they were giving 25%, 50%, 75%, and 100%. And Ms. Kim actually took them around to the classrooms and, and trained them at, to look and to decide if trash was 25%, 50%, 75%, 100%, they did correctly. Each class had a final tally and even tickets were int introduced for improper recycling. Next slide, please. Finally, then a possible ticket. Students from Mrs. Velez's class decided while recycling that they wanted to give classes that were not recycling a, correctly a ticket. A ticket was issued for any category that scored 50% or under. The tickets were made out of index cards in the beginning. However, later on, a formal work was designed by me, um, which was fun. The criteria for the ticket was determined by the students. So the actual 50% and under, when they went around to the classrooms, they stood there with Ms. Kim and said, no, it's not going to be 75 cents. It's not going to be 20. 50% is when we're going to give a ticket for any possible category. Next slide, please. Kudos to all who participated in the 2017-2018 Sustainability Initiative. Kim Velez, Alita Ward, Dawn Kerhansen, China Brown, Chanel Lindsay, Jason Corley, Daniel Barrett, and all of my students and staff. And of course, our administrators, Ebony Russell, Carmela Montaniel, Marissa Bahari Banzi, and Allison Nadesh, and a special shout out to Mr. Copeland, because without his help, I could not have done it. Thank you. Yeah. And thank you, Ellen. You know, thank you. Thank yeah. you. So Miss Ellen really like founded everything for us <laughs> and um, you. got the ball rolling. And then you can move forward. I'm just going to kind of talk about our current initiatives because we've uh, kind of picked up from oh, you... um, where Miss Ellen left off. And yeah. I'm actually just kind of supporting the sustainability coordinator, who is Miss Jasmine Murphy at this point. But um, we also, we wrote a couple of grants this year to continue the work that Miss Ellen began. Obviously, it's kind of been a tumultuous road because we had like a really flourishing garden and a lot of recycling initiatives. And then we had to move for our buildings to be repaired for two years and that really set us back. Um, and so we wanted to get things back on track. And so we had Miss Ellen started with Project Rags last year. And then this year we submitted a... Um, a sustainability grant to get a new water bottle refill system, which is something that our students have been advocating for, and we call it Team Dope, which just stands for Defending Our Planet and Environment. The students came up with the name, and um, we they wanted to really hone in this year on focusing on reducing our plastic consumption through reusable water bottles, which um, obviously led to the grant because they felt the um, refillable water grant was key to reducing our plastic consumption as a school. Um, so, sorry, and then, yeah, so we had our students, um, they took this pledge and they're, um, you know, taking it very seriously, which I think is really cool to see this kind of ownership in our students because we are in a alternate assessment program with students with significant cognitive disabilities. And um, this pledge and this project, like Ms. Ellen with the classes before, it's been something they've been able to understand and they've been able to take ownership of and they've been able to take their own data of. So um, you'll see as we go through the slide, at this point, we're doing a similar thing where we're going through the classes to do classes, um, classroom checks on the bins, which we got through Ms. Ellen's work with the Office of Sustainability, checking to make sure that they are being used accurately. Um, it does require a lot of logistical work with our custodial staff to ensure that they're also sorting and um, carrying it through on their end and um, in addition, we are, you know, telling people that we do have this um, water bottle refill coming. So as a kind of initiative to, you know, slow our, we have a culinary room that does sell water bottles and we're hoping that eventually that will no longer exist. We will only have refillable water bottles and not be selling plastic water bottles. Um, so we do have students doing all the data tracking for this. As you can see, my class is one of the ones that goes around. We have um, a sheet where we, speak with the class and not only do we check their bins, we also ask them if 
you know, a self-assessment, have they been recycling appropriately? And we ask them to commit to start whether or not they have um, to continue. And so this um, data is kind of, you know, evaluated and put into more concise um, Excel sheets by me and Ms. Jasmine, who are then able to see kind of our progress along with that. Um, we are going to, as you see on here, present kind of our growth to the entire school during our Earth Day celebration. Um, and then obviously we're having, as I mentioned earlier, we're having this water bottle restill, refill station installed as well, um, which is part of our Say No to Plastic campaign. Um, and then this is obviously kind of the recycling um, portion of it. And then I also am one of the garden liaisons at our school. Um, and there's no slides on this, but just to touch on the garden liaison side of it, our garden, we're trying to bring it back. Um, Ms. Ellen put so much of her sustainability grant towards revitalizing the garden. And this year we got a small grant from Grow to Learn to continue um, to revitalize it. And in addition, we are looking at it through a vocational lens as that's a big push in our program. And we're planning to um, make it not only an in-house work site with our students that are in the six one um, more restrictive classes like a six one one setting. Um, we're also looking to use it kind of as a feeder to a class like my class, which has work-based learning sites at Brooklyn Bridge Park and Brooklyn Botanic Garden every week. Um, so we kind of have like the two sides very similar to um, 721K where we have the garden side and then we have the recycling side of it. and trying to work those in conjunction to teach the students, you know, to take ownership over this social justice and also the vocational piece of just these technical skills they're learning. I'd just like to jump in for one minute, just to let you know our students had some prior knowledge to plastic uh, pollution, because we did an Earth Day celebration last mm -hmm. year on it. And also uh, we have some great staff here and students who will go around and collect bottles mm -hmm. and to, to basically clean up our school. Mm -hmm. So they're very much into recycling. Kudos to them all. Yeah. Kudos to the staff at the Office of Sustainability. You have been great. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Thank, thank you, Sarah, and thank you, Ellen, um, for explaining a little bit more on what really happens in the schools. Um, so we'll open, we'll open everything up for questions now. There we go. So we'll look, we'll look at the Q and A, and see if there's any questions. All right. So if you have any questions, please enter them in the Q and A box. Um, and while we're waiting for that, I have um, I have a question for for Erin actually. Um, you know, Sarah and, and Ellen talked a lot about the challenges on the ground, and I was wondering, Erin, you, you've enlisted so much help from all the other organizations, but what were your um, biggest challenges in doing that? Um, just to clarify, in, um, in fostering the, uh, the partnerships or in, in the construction of the garden on the school level? Um, the question was in fostering the partnerships, or, but, but any kind of challenges you sort of encountered on the ground, I think would be interesting for other sustainability coordinators and teachers? Yeah, um, I found that finding partnerships is, is relatively, um, people are, are willing to, um, to work with us. Um, when, when they hear about the, the nature of the project, um, I think a lot of people just want to help. Um, and that's really helped us in, um, in, yeah, in fostering those partnerships. Um, and in the terms of time, um, it, we've had staff members that volunteered their own time to um, install fences, um, lay pavers. Um, you know, we, we've had to find staff members with specific sets of ex expertise, and um, but they were willing to help. And I think that that was a bit of a, a struggle. Um, it's taken some time, but we were able to, to accomplish a great thing. Thank you. Um, any other questions? Don't be shy. Yep, I think we have a question. We have a question. 
We have a question. Can Mrs. Laraway please prescribe the type of vegetables she was able to successfully grow? Yeah, that's a great question. We've actually, um, we actually have two fig trees out there um, that were donated to us. Uh, New York Restoration Project gave them to us. So we have figs. Um, we've grown, as for vegetables, we have squash. Um, one of our custodians built a trellis for us, so we don't have a lot of um, horizontal space, so we went vertical and we, we installed several trellises um, so that we have cucumbers, um, we've done butternut squash, acorn squash, um, tomatoes and basil are always a huge hit at our uh, indoor farmer's market. Um, We've done strawberries, um, kale, collard greens, uh, broccoli. Um, it, it depends on the year, it depends on the seeds. Um, we get seeds donated also um, through the seed giveaways uh, through Grow to Learn and Grow NYC. So it, it depends on which seeds we get each year. Thank you, Erin. And maybe we can extend that question also to Sarah and, and Ellen and see what they have planted. We're still in the cleanup stage, yeah. but we have a ton of seeds that we bought. Basically, mm -hmm. we're looking at annuals. And as far as the garden on the side, which was where we would put our um, our big buckets, let's put, put, put it that way, a big, large planters, that's where the fruits and vegetables would have to go. As I said before, we had potatoes, we had tomatoes. Mm -hmm. I know that they had lettuce. And this is basically in the planning stage since we've come back from um, Sheep's Head Bay. And uh, we were absolutely floored when we saw the garden. So I'm imagining it will stay in the uh, floral garden. And I know we had roses back there. We're in the process of doing that. But, um, and, and of course, it'll be a vegetable garden on the mm -hmm. side. We have plenty of space there. We have plenty of light. Um, amazingly, when we did the soil samples, now that was contaminated soil. Out of those soil samples, and I wish I had the picture of it, grew life. So mm -hmm. things can grow back there, things will grow back there. It just is gonna take some time. Yeah, and I mean, we are planning, we are buying some raised beds with our new grant mm -hmm. that will, we're gonna try to make into an edible garden, but like Ms. Ellen said, we just have to be really strict. Our soil was really contaminated, so we have to be really careful where we place those. and to ensure that there's absolutely like no cross contamination happening. So we're placing those in like the sidewalk away from like the traditional right. garden area. Um, and hopefully we will have some success. And um, we work closely with the um, Grow to Learn District 75 office to kind of plan that. I also hope we can keep in touch with Miss Laraway as she seems to be so knowledgeable <laughs> and fruitful. Yeah, literally. And so maybe through this uh, webinar, we can sort of connect. Yeah. I'd like to know how she got her uh, partners and how, su how successful she was. And I think that's something that we, that mm -hmm. we can share here. That would be great, yeah. We yeah. Yeah, um, I, had, I did have a question for um, maybe either Ms. Lairway or, um, um, I'm sorry, I forgot the gentleman's name from the office. Mr. 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 Copeland. Bad, yeah. Okay, sorry, um, but I, do wonder like are there requirements for um the school custodial staff to sort this like is there plans in the future to require schools to sort their waste because i think that's a challenge we face we cannot control the middle school in our building yes and so our custodial staff gets frustrated when they're sorting our waste and then the middle school is not taking on the same initiative we are not associated with the middle school we just cohabitate in this building Sure, I can answer that. And Aaron, you can jump in if you have personal experience with this. Um, so technically, from a custodial standpoint, it, they're, not, they're not required or it's not in their job description to sort any waste at all. Their job is to maintain separation that the sorting was created by your students and by your staff. So if your students and staff are properly recycling, it's the custodial's job to maintain that and keep it straight and put it on the curbside for the correct day. So I wanted to clarify that to start out with. The second thing is that yes, every school in New York City is required to recycle both by local law within the city and Chancellor's Regulation, A850. Um, if you would like specific help with getting something off the ground at a school 
uh, introduction to another school. Uh, this is where our, our office can come in. We can send some of our outreach team there. Uh, if you're, especially if you're in the building, perhaps there's a building council meeting, uh, we could come with you and sit on the agenda at that meeting and have this as a topic of discussion, then find out what that school needs to get them off the ground. Marlene, uh, one of the reasons why I looked at the recycling in the classrooms, because I knew in the cafeteria our numbers would be low. And I knew our students were recycling. Um, so I decided to take the percentages from the classrooms. Yeah. This year, if I moved it up, I wanted to uh, speak to 266 upstairs to see if we could get some of our students up there to do the same thing. Well, needless to say, it didn't happen, but it is something to look at. And maybe then, in the future, try to get them in the cafeteria to work, because I think it's a process. I really do. It is. And you're, you're very smart to what I, do what I call divide and conquer. So I encourage schools to either start with the classrooms or the cafeteria, don't do it all at once or you'll get overwhelmed and That's even start possible. smaller. If, even if you choose the cafeteria, like let's just spend a one month focusing on just plastics or just milk cartons and then expand it out from there once you see that there's mm -hmm. uh, some traction. Well, I know um, 266 is, par I think it's the parent, I don't know if it's the parent coordinator, I think it is. And um, they had offered to help us with the garden, but I was a little hesitant at first because we were, we were having such problem with the recycling. I didn't want them to jump in the garden. I wanted to take it one step at a time. So I think that's a conversation that um, Jasmine and Sarah can have first through our principal, from principal to principal, because we have to pull administration on board or else right. we get nowhere. And then, uh, what is it? They have their own coordinator upstairs. Yeah, if you want to email me, I can look up who their coordinator is and do it. Absolutely. Email. Because yeah. that's the only way we're going to get anywhere. Right. Yeah. yeah, and our thought is hopefully that these refillable water bottle stations will like kind of spur momentum yeah. because it'll be like an easy way to refill and reduce plastic. Everybody's going to be jealous that your school yeah. has one. They're the most popular. Yes, yes, yes. I want them to be jealous. Yeah. <laughs> but thank you on this note. Thank you all very, very much to the panelists and to the participants for being here today, I think it's time to wrap it up. Um, upon leaving um, the webinar, you'll receive a short link to a survey. Uh, please fill it out. We'd love your feedback on what we did right or wrong. Um, and we hope to see you at the next webinars. So we have uh, a series set up for the spring. It's on the screen right now. Um, and then also check out our, um, our website, um, Teachers College slash sustainability. Um, and stay tuned um, for what we do here as well. So thank you very much for um, attending today. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, everybody. Thanks. Thanks.